Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Our hymn, yes. Glorify Thy Name. Love it. Yes. Love it. Of course, as you'll probably already know about me, there's not many church songs I don't love. <laughs> Especially if you get to pick them out, right? <laughs> I like them. 2016, in the faith we sing, if you'll rise in body or spirit and join me, please. 2016. If anybody came up to you and asked you if you were absolutely certain that if you were to die right now, you'd go to heaven, what would you say to them? What would you be able to say to them? How secure and how assured are you of your eternal salvation? Um, what would you say to God if he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Many people don't know what they'd say. What do you think you would say? I'm not asking for a testimony yet, but what do you think you would say to God? Some people say, well, Lord, I've tried to keep the Ten Commandments. I've tried to be a good person. I've tried to help little old ladies across the street, and now I'm asking little old ladies to help me across the street. And uh, so I, I try to be a good person. I've had people say that to me before. 
The Bible says there are several things we need to know about receiving eternal life. That we need to know about going to heaven and what, what God requires for that to take place. Eternal life is different than just living forever. Uh, the Word of God said in, in 1 John 5.13, These things I've written to you, the Spirit of God through, through John, these things I've written to you, that you may know that you have eternal life. What a powerful statement that is. Eternal life is written in this language like we have eternal life when we become a believer. Not when we're going to get to heaven. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. But we receive eternal life right now. That's good news. I'm glad of that. A while back I spoke with a friend about the difference between eternal life and just living forever. Eternal life has to do with quality, not just, not just quantity, but also quality and quantity together. We live together with God forever. That's eternal life. Now, if you take God out of the picture there, and we just live forever, that's what living forever means. And my friend, I said, I said uh, well, are, are you interested uh, at, at, in living, uh, in having eternal life. We talked about it for a while. And his, his answer to that question really puzzled me. He said, well, if the definition you gave of eternal life is living forever with God, uh, then I don't want anything to do with that. I said, well, why? He said, because I want to be with all my friends when I die and not with God. Interesting, interesting. Listen, there are some strange beliefs out there, and that's one of them. I explained that the place that you're talking about without God is described in the Bible as a place of great sorrow and terrible suffering. Still, he wanted nothing to do with eternal life. How about you? Are you certain that you'd go to heaven to be with God right now if you were to die so there's a difference between eternal life and just living forever. I hope you have the assurance of your salvation locked down solid because the Bible says these things I've written to you that you might know that you have eternal life in Jesus Christ. The gift of God, the Bible says, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And because heaven is a gift, like other gifts and other genuine gifts, it's something that it's not earned and it's not, des des it's not deserved. We talked about last Sunday in the sermon, no amount of personal effort or good works or religious deeds can earn a place for you in heaven. Last Sunday we talked about the prodigal son. Do you remember that? But we spent more time on the prodigal or on the prodigal's father, the amazing grace of the prodigal's father, who saw him come back after wasting and wasting all of his resources. And when the father saw him at a great distance, he got up and he ran toward his son. And he wrapped his arms around him. It says he fell on his neck. And he kissed him. And he he told his servant, said, go get the robe, the best robe. Go get the ring, the identity. Go get the sandals for his feet and celebrate for this my son was dead and he has come back. He is alive forevermore. God's grace does that in us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Why is it that no one can earn their way to heaven? Why is it it's of grace, it's of God, it's not of us? He said it's not of us. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. How is that true? Well, true, well the answer to that one is that all people have sinned. All people are sinners. All people have committed sins. As a matter of fact, all of us have fallen nature, have a fallen nature that keep us separated from God. All of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Sin is a transgression of God's law and includes such things as lying, lust, cheating, deceit, evil thoughts, immoral behavior, and more and more and more. 
The human race has thought up and designed so many different kinds of things that are not according to the word of God. It is absolutely amazing, right? And because of this, we can't save ourselves. If you wanted to save yourself by being good, do you know how good you would have to be? The word says, be therefore perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. We'd have to be that perfect. That's a high standard. No one can save themselves by that standard or be, or, or, or be secure of salvation or assure of your salvation. How, how, in spite of our sins, do we get to be saved if we can't do anything to bring salvation to ourselves? God's merciful. His mercy wants us to be with him for eternity. His mercy reaches out to us that he might bring salvation to us. His mercy says, I love them and I want them to be with me and my family forever. But his justice says, no sin shall come before my, my, my eyes. So we've got a dilemma. On the one hand, we are loved by God with divine, eternal love. On the other hand, we have a God whose justice says, you got to be perfect, just as I am perfect. How do we get those two things together? Well, God has a solution to the problem. God loves us and wants us always to be with him and all the billions who have gone on before us but we've sinned in our lives, and that sin prohibits us from being with God. We don't have the ability to solve the dilemma, but God solved the dilemma for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. If I was the kind of person that just sinned three times a day, three times a day, by the world's standards, that wouldn't be very many sins. Three times a day, thought one bad thought, said one bad, one bad thing, and took one of the pencils off your desk at work and put it in my pocket. That's just three sins a day, but the end of a year, that's over a thousand sins, a thousand sins. And I'm 76 plus years old. And that's 76,000 sins that I'd have to deal with. And I can't even pay for one of them. I can't even atone myself for one of them, according to the word. So Jesus came as the infinite God-man. The Word, and I don't know what that looks like for eternity, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And He went to the cross. He came with a mission. He lived a sinless life. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He was born without a fallen nature. He never committed a sin. He took our sins upon himself. Not just my 76,000 sins upon himself. But he took all the sins of all the people of all the world since Adam and beyond and in beyond that. However many people there are or are going to be in, on planet earth and in the kingdom of God from now ever. His sacrifice dealt with all of those sins, all of those people. That is so mind-blowing. It just, if I, I just stop and think about what he did for me, and to think that you multiply that, and there are nearly eight billion people on the planet now, not counting all the billions that have gone on before and had the opportunity to receive Jesus, and he said the way is broad and Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many are those who go to destruction. But narrow is the gate, straight is the path that leads to righteousness and truth, and few there are who go into that path. So out of the great hordes of people that God has created and that have come to planet Earth, it looks like there are going to be relatively few who choose to go the way of the cross and many, many will be going the way that my friend, my friend years ago, told me that he wanted to go not having anything to do with eternal life. Wow. 
All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to their own ways, and the Lord has laid upon him, Jesus, the iniquity, sin of us all. Isaiah 53, that's in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ took our sins into his body on the cross and now offers you eternal life. Heaven is a free gift, a free gift which you and I can't do anything but receive. That's all you can do with a gift. If you try to pay for a gift, then it negates the gift, right? If I buy you a bicycle and for your birthday, and you say, well, how many hours I'm going to have to work for this one? You negate the gift. It's not a gift anymore. A gift is something that, I, that you are given by someone. If it's not a gift and, and you had to earn it, then it's, uh, it is something else, but it's not a gift. He says that he gives us the free gift of eternal life as we receive him and believe on him. Many people mistake a couple of kinds of faith. Eternal life is received by faith. Faith is believing something because there is evidence behind what we are believing. We're not asked to believe in blind faith. We're not asked to believe in something we cannot have any evidence for. We are studying that some on Alpha, the Alpha program. If you remember, uh, Nikki Gumbel has said that a few times. But there is, faith, uh, there is faith and there is evidence for what we believe. Hal Lindsey wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And the evidence that he gives us in that book just is scripture and, and examples of those who've come to Christ and know him to help us understand the power of faith. Many people make a couple of mistakes with regard to faith, though. One of them is that faith in Jesus Christ for salvation is not something that is just head knowledge. It's not like a, uh, it's not just something that you, that you learned in school, like you learned how to write or read. It's not head knowledge like believing in the existence of El Capitan. Do you know what El Capitan is? Out in Yosemite, and we were just out there a week and a half ago, <clears throat> we got to spend the day in Yosemite National Park El Capitan is a 3,000 foot tall stone, uh, granite stone. It's located in Yosemite National Park in California. It's, uh, faith in Jesus' salvation is not mere head knowledge like believing in Half Dome. Have you heard of Half Dome? Do you know what that is? It's another gigantic stone that sticks out of the ground there in Yosemite National Park. And Half Dome rising nearly 5,000 feet out of the ground there at, National, at Yosemite, 8,800 feet above sea, sea level. It's not like believing that those things exist. That's not, that's not what saving faith is all about, as though we would believe in, in Brother Kelly when we never saw Brother Kelly before. Believing the reality of these massive stone mountains, I'm not talking about Brother Kelly there, but, and never seeing them is different than the kind of faith the Bible talks about for salvation. The Bible says that the devil believes in God and he trembles. So believing that there is one God is not the same thing as saving faith. Saving faith is also not mere temporal faith, that is, trusting in God in, in, in uh, some temporary crisis such as financial, family, or physical needs. Some people say, oh, yeah, well, I believe in God. He's gotten me through a lot of tough times in my life. And we should trust in God, and we should trust in Christ through tough times. But that is not what brings salvation. That's not the kind of faith. Saving faith is is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, for your eternal life. It means resting upon Jesus Christ alone and what he said for you and what he did for you and not what you and I have done or can do. It is our responsibility simply to believe and receive. That doesn't earn anything. It simply receives a gift 
that has been given out of extraordinary love and extraordinary compassion for us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the word says in Acts 16, 31, and you will be saved. The question that God is asking you and me is, would you like to receive the gift of eternal life if you have not done that in your life yet? To receive eternal life means that you need to do just a couple of things. It means you need to transfer your faith from what you have been doing to, to uh, help you uh, believe that you have eternal life. You transfer it from trusting in yourself to trusting in what Christ has done for you on his cross. Salvation faith is accepting Jesus as Savior, opening the door of your heart to his love. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them and sup with them and them with me. In Romans 4.25, Scripture says that Jesus was delivered up to the cross because of our offenses, and he was raised from the dead for our justification. We believe that, that he died for us and was raised from the dead for us. We also receive Jesus not just as Savior, but also as Lord. That means we give him the driver's seat. We give him the control of our life, not the back seat where he stays uh, quite a bit of the time and many cars and many lives, the back seat. And we repent of sin. We're willing to turn from any sin, anything, anything that is not pleasing to him. He will reveal to us in his grace what we need to do as we grow up in our relationship with him. Now, if that's what you want in your life, you can go to God and prayer, pray a prayer right now where you're sitting you can receive his gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ right now if you've not done that. Or you can re rededicate your life to Christ as Savior and Lord. For with the heart, we just read, for with the heart we believe unto righteousness. And with the mouth we confess unto salvation. For whosoever will may call upon the name of the Lord. For whosoever will and whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, then call upon him and ask him for this gift right now. And I want to pray a suggested prayer for you right now. So if you'd like to ask Christ into your life, or if you'd like to rededicate your life to Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. It's simple when it's one I've prayed with you before a number of times and have more to come. But... Pray silently to him if you'd like to. And he will respond to you in grace and love. Lord Jesus. That's right. Just pray silently to the Lord. Lord Jesus. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. I know that I'm a sinner. And do not deserve eternal life. But thank you that you love me and you died and rose from the grave to prepare a place in heaven for me. I now trust you and you alone for my eternal life. And I repent of my sins. Please take control as Lord of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I praise your name. In your name I pray. Amen. If that's a sincere prayer of your life and your heart, look at what it means that Jesus promised to give you in that prayer. John 6, 47 says, I say unto you that those that believe on me shall have everlasting life. Everlasting life. If you truly repented, forsaken, forsake your sins and turn to him, and place your trust in Christ, sacrificial death for you. And you receive the gift of eternal life. You're now a child of God forever. Forever. Welcome to the family. In John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become sons and daughters of God, even to those who believe in his name. Today's your spiritual birthday if you just received him as your Savior. 
You'll always want to remember this day. The Bible speaks of those who have received eternal life as those, in these words, they are the ones who, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Spiritual rebirth that he spoke with Nicodemus about. Thanks be to God for his eternal love for us. Every now and then it's important for us to get back to basics, isn't it? And I give you this sermon, this message, and uh, I pray that you would be blessed and strengthened and perhaps renewed in your walk with Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a final hymn now as our ladies come to guide us. I have decided to follow Jesus. We didn't, we didn't arrange that, did we, Melanie? No. <laughs> that just, uh, number 2129 in the faith we sing. I have That's why it's so cool. That's why it's so cool. <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. I hope you are living that decision every day of your life. In Jesus' name. Let's stand up and worship the Lord together. The altar is open if you'd like to spend some time here in prayer. And he hears you. He loves you. 2129. 2129, yes. May we listen more closely and may we behave more obediently. May you be glorified as we walk with you. Fill us with the Holy Spirit for this week. We praise you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.